What's going on, Rotor Grinders? Welcome back to the morning grind. Once again, Dean filling in for Stevie. Stevie, of course, is knocking out his NASCAR content. If you guys want to get his NASCAR content, of course, you know where to get that here at Rotor Grinders. Uh, we've been doing a lot of late with uh, not a lot of content out there going on as far as DFS wise. Uh, just having different guys on and doing DFS personalities, DFS origin stories. Today, we have actual DFS content, I should say. Uh, go back and check the archives. They're evergreen. You can listen to Kevin Roth, who was on a couple days ago. We had uh, Rusty Nuts, uh, Grant Niefer, Be Beer Makers fan, Head Chopper, Fast Eddie Fear, a whole slew of people. You can check it out on the podcast feed. You can also check it out on the YouTube stream. We're on YouTube as well. So either way, both works. That said, we have actual DFS content today. We're talking uh, a Millie Maker in the world of MMA. And I know somebody who's super excited. It's eighth ranked here as far as the Rotor Grinders rankings when it comes to MMA specifically. We're talking the Sun Tzu Joe, Art of War on Twitter. Joe, uh, I know you're giddy about the, this is the first time, first time we're having a million maker ever in MMA. This is the culmination of five years of MMA DFS as the red-headed red -headed stepchild to all of DFS. This is uh, the moment that we, we, we revel in glory. And look, I am going to do my best to win it. But if I don't, I would really love for one of the core group of, of MMA Twitter guys uh, to win this and not like you look nothing against the high volume <laughs> of the year type players like yourself and you know you know the names of the guys who I'm talking about um, you know they're going to be in this because it's just too much money to not be but I would really love it if I don't take this down I um, mean I got Ivy League school to pay for so if I, <laughs> if I don't take this down I hope it's one of our core group of MMA guys that have been dedicated to this since 2015. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second, but I do want to kind of take a look back at last week, which, by the way, congratulations. You nailed a – I asked, give me somebody in Vegas, give me a live dog, and you gave me a live dog. So now, hey, you're only as good as your last pick. you got to give me one this week, too. Hopefully you'll have one uh, cooked up for us on layaway. But last week, uh, it's just worth kind of taking a step back and looking at the slate and seeing how it went down. And, you know, doing this podcast, uh, I just – and not a lot of DFS going down. I decided to, to dabble in MMA, and I am by no means an MMA expert, but I, I played a little bit. Uh, one of my three lineups did well, uh, but the nice. big thing, of course, is we had um, uh, well cashed. It wasn't like a monster or anything. It was good enough, I suppose, to cash. Which there you go, that's something. It, I, I, there was no screen life, uh, screenshot life on my Twitter feed, unfortunately. But uh, what did we learn anything from last week? I suppose uh, when you have a really, really cheap guy that's heavily favored, everybody's going to roster him. Yeah, unfortunately, we had a seven point three k fighter. We explained the circumstances around that last week, how he ended up being such a big favorite. The, the favorite in that fight, Kevin Holland, was, medic, was not medically cleared to fight. Um, and I guess we'll find out more about what that means at some point if, if anyone's interested. Uh, but what DraftKings was, is, has always been reticent to do is actually, even though we had a replacement fighter step in, the natural thing to do would have been to move the Daniel Rodriguez, who was the 7.3K salaried fighter who was an underdog to Kevin Holland, would be to move him into Kevin Holland's spot and whoever they bring in as the replacement um, to move that person into Kevin Holland's salary range. But they did not do that. Um, and, you know, I, there's arguments, pros and cons. I, I don't want to use this form for that. Um, so what ended up happening is we had a 7.3K fighter who was a, like a minus 400 favorite who was 75% owned in the main contest. You don't see numbers like that. And to sort of add insult to injury, the guy that he fought, Gabriel Green, was incredibly game in the fight, which allowed Daniel Rodriguez to land the unheard of number in a three-round fight of 175 significant strikes. So you have, and remember, you're getting um, one point for every two significant strikes. So with the win bonus, he ends up putting up 125 points and which, which kind of set the tone for the slate when you've got a 7.3 guy who's 75% owned, um, you know, scoring 125 points, that set the tone for the slate. Yeah, subsequently I was looking at the, the ownership and basically half the field was less than 15% owned, which seems uh, pretty crazy, but it all makes sense math-wise when 75% are on Rodriguez and you can only have so many guys out there. And I think Dern, who uh, you were on as well too, uh, was the second favorite as far as ownership. So it was a big week for Chalk. Uh, what are we looking at as far as this week? Before we dive into the, the Million Maker uh, you know, thought process, because with, what is it, 40% at top, you know, 2.5 million as far as the total prize pool, 1 million at the, yeah. at the top. 
Yeah. I think it's a different strategy. I mean, I don't know anything about MMA, but I would imagine it's got to be, you have to be more ambitious. You have to like uh, open up your variants, open up the, the well, what if uh, options. Uh, as far as general thought, as far as the slate, I know you said you like both cash and tournaments. Uh, you know, well, what's our first thing? I guess we're talking about the Nunez at the top. You know, she's the heavy favorite here uh, in the five round potential fight. Minus 670 in Vegas versus Spencer. Uh, not just a, a minus 670, but they're also saying it's minus 360 that's going to finish within, within the distance, which is both the highest numbers for all the fighters across the board when it comes to who's going to win and are they going to win, uh, you know, in the time or because of decision. So I guess the question is, uh, how much do we need Nunez? Because she looks like, I don't want to say a sure thing, but the strongest thing. Yeah, so a lot, a lot to kind of cover there. So first and foremost, you're absolutely correct, Dean. In the, in the, with the 40% on top, um, you have to approach this like you would approach a Millie Maker in other sports. Um, if you really want to go for the first prize, you need to differentiate yourself from others. I mean, you, you have to apply a strategy where I'm just going to throw out a number. I don't know if this is going to be her ownership or not, but let's say Felicia Spencer is 5% owned. That's the underdog in the main event. You need to put her in 10 or 15% of your lineups. Um, if you want to actually truly go after that Millie Maker, because the only way you're, there's not going to be a plethora of ties up top is if there is some level of differentiation in, um, you know, in, in the lineup. Now, I'm, I know there's going to be ties. It's a matter of, you know, am I going to split this pool up with, with 15 or 20 of my best friends, or am I going to split it up with 150? Right. So that that's kind of how you have to look at this. And to your first point, it's very rare that I look at a slate and say, I could see this as a cash slate or a GPP slate. I think when we spoke last week, I had no idea what my cash lineup was going to be. I honestly didn't know what my cash lineup was going to be until Saturday morning when I finalized it. And as it turned out, I did not do very well in cash. So I was right in that it was not going to be a great cash week for me. This week, I can actually see it as a pretty good cash week. And on the GPP side, I see at least five fights that are very closely lined that can go in either direction. Uh, from a cash game perspective, do you have to put Nunez in? I assume you do. Uh, you know, I think you've got to play Nunez. I mean, I think there are enough um, an, enough mid-level priced fighters that have an opportunity to win as an underdog that you don't have to do what they call a stars and scrubs lineup you know, which is essentially like, like top load um, two people and then kind of just like bottom fish. There, it's a really interesting card, Dean. You've got two veterans who have been off for a while who are coming back to fight younger fighters, like up-and-comer prospects that the UFC wants to push. One of those veterans, I feel, has a legitimate chance to do well, if not win the fight. Um, you've got a number of fights, like I said, that are pretty evenly balanced, um, you know, that I would, I would be shocked if there was big wide line movements in these fights. Um, so I see that there's some variance here. Um, and, and in terms of getting Nunez and actually my favorite play, um, because of, you know, being, being at a better price point is Alonzo Menafield. Um, I like Menafield a lot here and, you know, he has the potential if Nunez doesn't, um, finish this fight early or if she doesn't get a lot of grappling points or significant strikes, I could certainly see Menafield potentially outscoring Nunez. So you can certainly put a lineup together with um, Menafield and Nunez um, and not have to dive too deep. Bottom fish. Menafield uh, minus 240, according to Vegas. And uh, as far as if that fight's going to finish within the distance, basically they're saying it's not at minus 278. So uh, no, I, I think, it, I think they're saying it is. My, oh, did I flip it? Yeah, my, my apologies. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I meant to say it, but I, I flipped it in my head. So uh, you are saying that they're going to knock him out, most likely. Right? Dude, I just I just had a hot flash because I'm like, oh my god, I, I really misread this. <laughs> I didn't look at I, I didn't look at the line, but I couldn't believe that those would be the actual odds. Um, okay. No, good. I'm glad we straightened that out. Yeah. So I like Menafield a fair amount. He's always had a hard time getting fights. No one really wants to fight him. So even though Devin Clark is game, he's got some wrestling chops. Devin Clark is good until he hits a certain level of fighter. They call him the Brown Bear. He's been in the UFC for a couple of years. Um, I, I think this is like overshooting his skis here. Um, I see Menafield getting a relatively easy win and potentially outscoring Nunez. Um, I really do like him. I think he's a really solid play in cash. If you don't want to 
pay up that extra money for Nunez, or if you want to combine him with Nunez and then do a little bit of, of mid-range or, or mid-lower tier fishing to fill out your cash lineup. Uh, Nunez is 9.4K, Metafield is 9K, and then in between them is uh, Stenham, uh, I'm sorry, Stammen and O'Malley, and O'Malley specifically is the second biggest favorite on this card, minus 455, uh, and is also heavily favored, uh, minus 235 to finish this fight, you know, within the first three rounds as well, too. Do you like Merrifield, I'm sorry, Metafield, more than O'Malley? Uh, I do, and and it's, it's, again, thanks for the perfect lead. Um, we're really in sync here. So I mentioned earlier that there was one veteran that was coming back that I thought had a reasonable chance to do well, um, if not win the fight. And that veteran is named Eddie Wineland. Um, and he is fighting Sean O'Malley. Um, Sean O'Malley, the sugar show, um, came back after a USAD expansion for um, partaking in the devil's lettuce. Um, uh, so he was on suspension for a while. He came back and they lobbed him an incredible softball. Um, and did he not? He did he look good in that fight? Absolutely. Um, Eddie Wineland is 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 a savvy veteran. Um, you know, was competitive in his fights before taking some time off. Um, you know, I think he might be either a full time fireman or something. I, I, I don't want to mix my I don't want to mix things up here. But um, he, you know, he has come off a of layoffs before and performed well. And I see this as a huge step up for Sean O'Malley. Now I'm not saying that Sean O'Malley doesn't have a chance here. I'm just saying that I think at his price point, um, you know, Eddie Wineland is very live. And I think from a safety perspective, I'd be a lot more surprised if Devin Clark was able to beat Menafield or Felicia Spencer was able to beat Nunez than Eddie Wineland beating Sugar Shane O'Malley. Yeah, Wineland is 6.9K, Spencer the cheapest in the board at 6.8K. And just jump back for a second as far as the, the main event with Nunez versus Spencer. Uh, are we playing? You talk about the, the prospect of playing Spencer maybe ten percent or so, or maybe just double whatever the projected field is as far as ownership. Yeah. Uh, would you pair Spencer with Nunez in the hopes they slug it out for five rounds? I think that's going to be hard to win a GPP. Yeah. I, I don't even know because I see some value in other dogs. I don't even know if I would look at that as a cash play. So um, I think I'm gonna. I would go naked Spencer. No pun intended. Um, you know, or Naked Nunez, no pun intended. Um, you know, let's talk about Felicia Spencer a little bit, okay? Felicia Spencer is a natural 145er. This is Nunez defending her 145 belt. Nunez is a dual belt holder. She holds the 135 belt, which is the bantamweight belt, which is a much deeper division, and she holds the 145 belt, which is not a very deep division. There's not a lot of women's fighters in this division. She won that belt by kind of shocking uh, Cyborg, who everybody seems to know, um, and finishing her in the first round. Um, it's hard for either of these ladies to get fights in 145. Felicia Spencer is Canadian. They call her the Phenom. She has got a very good broad-based wrestling game. Not a super great striker, but is really good at wrestling. So the idea is, and again, I'm not saying that it's practical in any way, shape, or form, but Nunez has had some issues with cardio in the past. Um, Felicia Spencer, she clearly lost against Cyborg, but she went the distance with Chris Cyborg. Not many people go the distance with Chris Cyborg, and she might have even cut her up. Um, she might have landed a shot. It's like that, that, you know, Rocky versus Ivan Drago when he hits him with one punch and there's that little drop of blood, and, and, the, and the manager goes, he, ble he bleeds. So, like, I, I was kind of thinking the same thing when I saw her kind of, like, cut Cyborg. Um, so, uh, look, I am not, you know, advocating for Spencer to win. I'm saying that if you are chasing um, a, a million-dollar prize in a GPP that has multiple thousands of entrants in it, that you're going to have to do something that differentiates yourself. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm Joe Public. I don't know a heck of a lot about MMA, but I do know I'm aware of Amanda Nunez. I'm pretty certain she's, like, the best MMA fighter of all time from a female perspective, and... I know that she beat Cyborg. I know she beat Rousey. I know she beat Tate. Uh, Holly Holm, I think she beat as well, too. So maybe that you think that that's kind of baked into the line because Vegas knows that, hey, I know who Nunez is. I've never heard of Spencer. I think she's going to win. Uh, is that is that the accurate number, minus 670? Or you think A lot of people will tell you they think the number should be higher. You okay. know, there are people who I respect who think the number should be higher. On the other hand, I have seen a few, much fewer tweets 
where people are kind of saying, yeah, I could kind of see a path to victory for Spencer if this perfect storm scenario works out and, um, you know, they, 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 they spend most of the fight on the ground and towards the end of the fight, uh, you know, Nunez's cardio starts to get a little weak. I mean, she's actually in the past had like a breathing problem. Like she would wear those, those bandages that kind of open up your airways. And, um, you know, she's actually canceled the fight in the past before for that reason. Um, but I, you know, again, it's, it has to be a perfect storm scenario. And, and, you know, again, I don't necessarily see it happening and there may be another way to win, you know, to, to at least place highly place, um, in the million dollar and the million dollar contest. But I think a lot, a lot of different things would have to happen. Um, as opposed to, I'm pretty certain that if, if Spencer wins, that's going to eliminate 60, 70% of the lineups. Um, so then you've got 30 or 40% of the lineups, depending on ownership left where you only need a few different variations of outcomes to occur um, in order for you to be very competitive um, in that contest. If you're making like a hundred different lineups or 50 different lineups, whatever for the million maker, I would imagine you probably make similar lineups and just make one with Spencer and one with Wyland. Is that something you do? I would, I would do something like that. I mean, um, absolutely. And I am putting 150 lineups in. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to have, and, and I still have an opportunity to win a few more tickets, but I've been playing some esports and, you know, the UFC actually, even the past few UFC events, you had an opportunity to win um, satellite entries. So I have about 60 plus tickets that I have banked. Um, so I'm going to try to bank a few more and then obviously I'll just make up the difference in cash, but I'm going to put the 150 in. Uh, if you're going to do one lineup or two lineups or three lineups, um, look, I'm not saying that you can't play it to cash, but are you looking for, you know, an ROI in a million dollar contest? Or are you really trying to win a big prize? And if you're trying to win a big prize and you're not chasing return on investment, then you really should try to differentiate those lineups that you're putting in. If you're only doing a handful. You were talking about two veterans, right? The, the one fight with the veteran you're talking about was Eddie Wineland. What was the other yes. one? You, you, uh, okay, so the you other veteran, veteran, and this is one where... I am not so confident that the veteran is going to be able to get the job done. It's Evan who essentially retired is coming back and this is an added fight. So this was just dropped into the DraftKings um, salary pool yesterday. It's Herbert Burns. And if that name sounds familiar, he is the brother of the Burns who actually fought Tyron Woodley. Um, and he is coming and he is, um, he's much less experienced, but he is coming off of like a really impressive knockout victory of Nate Landauer. Um, and he's taking this fight relatively short notice. Um, Evan Dunham is kind of coming out of retirement to, to fight him. Again, this is another prospect versus veteran fight. UFC is obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but is, is looking to promote the prospect. Um, I think that this fight, and, and again, watch me come wind up with egg all over my face. Evan Dunham actually took some serious damage and really needed to retire. I mean, he really got hurt in a couple of fights. I mean, I was at a fight where he got really badly hurt to the body. Um, it was time for him to retire. So him coming back, I don't know if he legitimately thinks he has a chance to win or if this is just a good payday. And the UFC is saying, hey, hey, Evan, do us a favor. Like we got this guy we're kind of promoting. Give him a good fight. Um, you might even win. Um, but I honestly feel a lot better about Burns at 8.9K, um, you know, winning this fight than I do at O'Malley at a, at a higher price point, beating Eddie Wineland, who has actually proven he can come back off of layoffs and fight very competitively. Yeah, the tricky part of Burns here, I'm looking at on DK, 8.9K. You're not getting a big discount here at all. 9K, of course, for Manyfield. Nunez, not much more at 9.4K. Do you see yourself making a strong stand when it comes to those big spends? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm going to probably be, and I don't know, I don't, I'm not the best at forecasting ownership. I see myself being, because of my take on Wineland, I'm, I'm obviously going to have shares of, of O'Malley, but if I'm kind of looking at that upper tier, I want Menafield, I want Nunez, and I want Burns. Like, I want those guys in that upper tier because I think – to me, that's where I see the most value and the best chance of there not being an upset. I probably want a little bit less of O'Malley. And look, O'Malley can go out there and dominate. It's just I don't think 
we saw what we needed to see in a fight against a really inferior opponent, um, which was, to me, nothing more than a setup fight um, for O'Malley. Yes, he did what he was supposed to do, and he did it very impressively, but I want to see him kind of go into deep waters a little bit, and this will be a good test for him. And if he performs well, great. I will have shares of him, but I will probably be below market because I want more of many field. I want more of Burns. I want more of Nunez. Is there any fights we're just basically kind of sort of crossing out? Uh, we want no interest in. It's not going to be very flashy. It's going to go the distance. Nobody's going to score enough points. It's essentially a coin toss. Uh, if, I, if I'm if i doing my terrible, uh, my terrible research and I don't know anything, the one that pops out to me, uh, again, I know nothing. But I'm just curious if this makes sense to you, if it translates. Uh, Sterling versus Sandhagen. Uh, it's basically a coin toss according to Vegas, and they're telling us uh, it's more likely to go to the distance as opposed to finish because it's plus 150 to finish within the first three rounds. So am I correct in surmising that based off just two things and I know nothing else? Well, it's interesting because that fight is the one that probably most people will tell you is the real co-main event. Or actually people were actually arguing to have this fight move to the next card so it could be the main event. These are two really up-and-coming prospects off of winning streaks and there are, like, really hardcore opinions on who's going to win this fight on both guys. Um, now, I could potentially see this fight scoring well because there's probably going to be some ground fighting going on. Um, and both of these guys, if you look at their DraftKings totals, both of them tend to score quite well in fights that they win. Um, so I think, you know, this is a fight that you probably want to have equal exposure to with the knowledge that the – the um, the winner is probably going to score pretty well because that has been their, their historical pattern is the winner, you know, when, when either one of these guys wins, um, you know, Sterling, uh, you know, when Sterling wins, he tends to score well. Um, you know, we, we've got, um, you know, we've got a couple of other fights that I think are, you know, that I said are toss-ups where you're, you're going to get more value if you go with the underdog. Um you know, but I, I think you should probably have some exposure to this Sanhagen Sterling fight because, again, both of them, both of these fighters tend to score well when they win. Oh, yeah, I just kind of skipped over when we talked about Nunez. Uh, we talked about O'Malley, how you're probably going to be underweight in O'Malley. Uh, you know, Metafield, you're a fan of. Burns, you're a fan of. In between all that is uh, with Strauman. And Strauman is a big favorite, but also is not projected to win in the first three rounds. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing, again, I don't know anything, but it seems like that's one of the least popular amongst that first five. Does that make sense? That's probably true. Look, Cody Stamen is a good fighter. Um, he actually um, is coming off of a draw, which a lot of people thought he won, against uh, Song Yadong, one of the Chinese fighters that the uh, UFC is looking to promote. Um, Brian Boom Kelleher is a money machine as an underdog. I mean, if you look at his price points and – the fights that he's won at his salary points, he is constantly that underdog that people love. I mean, he's a very popular fighter. He appears on podcasts. He's kind of got his own little thing going. Um, I think he'll get some ownership um, for upset. Now, Stamen should win this fight, right? Um, if, if he can stay out of uh, Kelleher's guillotine, um, he should probably win this fight. He's got a distinct wrestling advantage. I think there's going to be some grappling points here. But what, what are, what's probably turning some people off this is some recency bias on Kelleher in how he's been able to kind of come through and win fights that he wasn't supposed to win or even be competitive in. You know, he actually has a couple of really good wins on his, you know, on his resume here. So I think, you know, Kelleher will get some ownership. I think Stamen is a sneaky play because there could definitely be grappling points here. If you're looking purely at inside the distance props, and again, a lot of these guys, or I should say not guys, a lot of the players who come in from other sports will tend to look at inside the distance props, Vegas month lines, above everything else. First thing I looked at, and I, yeah, and that, I'm, I'm a good, good, good example, I suppose, because... Uh, and, and, and look, yeah. and, and honestly, if I was coming into a sport like I play, I play eSports, I know nothing about these death-kill ratios. I'm taking it verbatim, like, okay, that this is how you want to build a lineup around these kill death ratios. Right. So I'm the same type of novice, like when I'm going into esports. So if you're looking at that metric, you know, you're probably going to pass over Cody in that upper tier because he doesn't have the best 
inside the distance lines. But you have to kind of look a little deeper and say, okay, well, what if this is a ground fight? What if we see grappling points, right? I mean, that's something you want to consider. Or what if you're really bullish on Brian Kelleher because of the recency bias and how he is as one, he wins when he's not supposed to win. And this is another fight he's not supposed to win. So I could see this fight getting some ownership. I agree with the whole line value argument, but I think you need to look a little deeper. And I certainly would not bypass this fight. I would certainly have some exposure to this fight if you want to underweight it, but definitely get a little bit of exposure to this fight. Uh, 12 fights, 24 fighters, 150 lineups you expect to make. Will you be crossing anybody out or we have ownership of everybody? At least See, I don't, I don't do that. I mean, I embrace the variance, so I am not going to cross anybody out. There's certainly some fights that I, I might be a little underweight to. I'm, I'm, my ownership is going to be pretty balanced with a few exceptions. I mean, again, I already told you I want more many field than, than O'Malley. Um, I'm, I might have a little bit less. Well, I'll probably be on market with Cody because I don't think he's going to be that highly owned. I kind of like Burns here, um, you know, to, to do fairly well. One fight that I might be a little under owned to is, um, or under ownership on is Perez Formiga. Um, these are, are, you know, 125ers. Um, you know, you have a, a veteran who has fought the best of the best is coming off of a few losses against a, uh, you know, an up-and-comer who's younger, who has an impressive record, but has really not fought any comp- anybody good or anybody really good. Um, competition-wise, these guys are light years apart. Um, you know, experience-wise, light years apart. Perez is the favorite in this fight. Um, I think at the very least, even if you like Perez to win, I, I would be hard-pressed to see him finishing Juicier Formiga and Juicier Formiga – while he might be at a wrestling disadvantage, his Brazilian jiu-jitsu is elite. Um, so he can, I, I, I would be hard-pressed to see Perez, you know, submitting him. Obviously, a knockout is possible. He probably has, he does have the advantage standing. But I could see Formiga trying to lock him up, trying to kind of throw up submissions. I could see this kind of being a grind fest for three rounds where the winner doesn't score a lot of points. Um, both of these guys have some fights where they've scored But the vast majority of their fights, they haven't scored a lot of points. So this is probably one where I'm going to be underweight, although I do have some love for the underdog in this fight, Formiga, who I think might be overlooked. And just purely from a competition competition standard, um, you know, is attractive to me at his price. Yeah, to your point, by the way, plus 150 to finish within the distance as far as that fight uh, let's get some cheapies. Let's get some mid-tier guys in there so we can make the big spends work. Uh, you mentioned Formiga, the guys around him. Uh, I mean, maybe the 7K range. Did anybody sort of jump out for you? Martin, Matolo, yeah, Bird. Perfect. Okay, so Martin. Um, Robert, Bird's more expensive, my bad. AKA, Go ahead. Uh, AKA um, Tony Martin, AKA Anthony Martin. Um, he either was or is still going out with Kylie Harrison, the, uh, the acclaimed uh, female judoka who is in the PFL who – um, won the million dollars this year in, in a in a weight class that they created for her because she can't get below 155. She's it just, sounds like a whole other podcast. I'm curious she, about this. <laughs> she's solid muscle. Kayla, Kaylee Harrison is an Olympic medal winner in judo. Uh, and they were, either were going out or are going out, but she's always screaming Rocco. You can hear her from the uh, background. He decided to go by Rocco instead of Tony. Look, this is a guy who's only lost to Damian Maya recently, which is no shame in, in kind of losing to Damian Maya, who's – elite Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter. Neil Magny is coming off of a very impressive win against the leech, Jiling Jiang, and it was a fight that he was an underdog. You know, I love that nickname, the leech. The leech I appreciate you dropping all the nicknames, by the way. I, I, they're it, all good. They're all solid. Uh, the, some of these nicknames are great. These UFC nicknames are great. Um, there's one guy, uh, the werewolf of Texas, so I kind of I like He's not on this card. Who's um, the guy Spike? What was Spike last week? What was his nickname? Spike Carlisle. His real name is something like like Harrison or, you know, I, I can understand why he goes by Spike. Um, <laughs> you know, r- reminds me of that Robin Hood men in tights where, uh, you know, f- she changed her name to Latrine. And the guy goes, you changed your name to Latrine? You know, what was it before? And she says, s Spouse. I don't, I don't know if we can use that level of profanity on this podcast, but. Um, yeah, so these guys got Robin Hood men in tights, the, the Mel Brooks. Uh, is that yeah, the Mel Brooks, like, yeah, you <laughs> yeah. changed your name to Latrine. You know, what was it before? You can imagine. Um, you know, so yeah, Rob, men in tights. So. 
Yeah, so kind of deviating from the point here. I like. I think Tony Martin's got a, a, a shot in this fight. I do like him. Um, his one loss to Damian Maya recently. Um, there's some recency bias on Magny because he looked really good against the Leech. And in all honesty, the Leech probably had the worst game plan or fight IQ I've seen in a fight this year and how he went up against Neil Magny. Um, Tony Martin is a smarter fighter. He, he trains at a good camp. Um, I certainly... I don't, I don't necessarily see him. I see this as, as a pick type of fight. Um, and he is, you know, he's an underdog. So I see some line value personally, whether people agree with me or not. I don't know. I think the recency bias on Magny is such that he's a, he's got a big fighter for a welterweight. He's got a really good reach. He's got good cardio. I think Martin though is a little better. I think he's a little better striker. I think he's a little better on the ground. I think Neil Magny can be hurt to the body. Um, I've seen him hurt to the body before. I've seen him actually get finished by body shots. Um, you know, Lorenzo Larkin did that to Neil Magny. So I kind of like Martin a little bit here. I think he's, I think this is a dog or pass fight to me. I'll probably be under ownership on, on, uh, on him because if, if, you know, if, if Tony Martin was competitive against Damian Maya, I don't see Magny finishing him. So this fight is probably going to end in a decision. And if it's going to end in a decision, I don't want a lot of Neil Magny. But I will take some of Tony Martin um, because I think he has more upside, and I think there's line value there. Yeah, to your point, I'm not sure if you looked this stuff just yet, but I, I fired up the DK Sportsbook, and that's uh, the Martin Magni fight plus 175 to finish within the distance. So, yeah, like you said, it, it's possibly going to go the distance there for sure. Um, other options? How about this? G- give me if I'm making a cash game, uh, who are like the one or two cheap guys that can make everything else work? Tony Martin. You know, I think I think Rocco Martin is, is a guy that could make things work. I think it's more of a GPP play, but I do have some love for Rafia Sunsau. Um, he's fighting Cody Garbrandt. Cody Garbrandt is exhibited extremely poor fight IQ in recent fights, along with a suspect chin. Um, he is a guy that was a boxer who has been concussed so many times I don't think he can remember. Like, you know, this is a guy I don't want to fight, but I'm pretty confident I could beat him in a spelling bee. Um, you know, he he's taken a lot of damage in his career. Um, I just, like, I think Rafi Sunsau has fought the elite of the elite. Um, he was right on the precipice of, you know, fighting for the title. He fought for he fought Marlon Marias. Um, he is a wily fighter. He's got good BJJ. Um, if, if Cody Garbrandt lapses into... Um, bad fight IQ and just kind of – and a Sun Sao is not known as a puncher, but I can certainly see him winning kind of a greasy decision. And if he does catch Cody Garbrandt right, potentially finish him maybe on the ground, maybe by punches, Cody Garbrandt is the favorite here. I don't see this necessarily as a cash play, but I do see this as a potential GPP punt. What is the one fight that you think uh, one of the two fighters, maybe one of the cheaper guys, one of the guys in the mid the mid tier – will be on the optimal lineup. Like, basically, somebody's going to knock somebody else out. Okay, so I think, maybe not knockout, I think submission. I think that um, if Gerald Marshart wins, he could potentially be on the optimal. He is fighting a guy named Ian Heinish. Um, Marshart uh, trains at a really good camp, um, has really good jujitsu. One of those, like, uh, uh, like I call them lunch pal fighters. Like, just like, but he's been around forever, worked his way up to the UFC, has had like winning streaks, losing streaks, knows every trick in the book, fights at a really good camp, and has really good jujitsu. Um, and we've seen Ian Heinish exposed before. This is a pretty closely lined fight, but um, you know, Gerald Marshart is the dog. Um, you know, I could certainly see Gerald Marshart winning this fight. I don't think anyone would be surprised with um, you know, Marshart winning. Um, you know, so I could, you know, and in and, and his wins, he scored fairly well. So I could certainly see, you know, if Mayor Short does get the win here, that he is on the optimal. You know, I'm on the DK, uh, you know, lineups, DK uh, Sportsbook. No, not the Sportsbook, DraftKings.com. I don't know why I can't yeah. say that correctly. Yeah. I'm on That's DraftKings.com right. and I'm checking out the fighters. And uh, you mentioned that somebody looked like uh, they have a, the lunch bell type guy. And I'm like, I want to see what this person looks like. Yeah. And like almost every one of these people, you can't see their picture. What's up with that, DK? Like, why am I not getting a picture of my, well, you know? Well, if you think it's bad, bad. If you think it's bad on DK, you should see FanDuel. <laughs> they had something like a 15-hour reworking, didn't they? They have, these, no, they have these like caricatures of fighters. <laughs> I like, did not see that. They want to tell you what Courtney Casey looked like with her flat top hat. I mean, yeah, they're not even real photos on FanDuel. So at least 
Um, you've got some like real photos from most of the fighters on, on DraftKings here. Um, but yeah, Mearshart is just like, he's one of those guys. Everybody likes him. He's, he's come through at underdog money before in the past, kind of like Kelleher to a certain extent. But I, I think this is an easier fight, <coughs> excuse me, for Mearshart than, than Stamen is for Kelleher. So I do kind of think Mearshart has that shot at being on the optimal. Um, he's, he, could, he could score some transitional points on the ground. He could potentially lock up a sub, and he's got a decent price on, on DK. Let's say Nunez ends up around 50% as far as the ownership. As of right now, we're recording this on a Wednesday afternoon. We're not going to hold this to you. You have you reserve the right to change your mind, but do you suspect you'll be over, under, or about 50% yourself? I think she'll probably be over in the big contest just because okay. of the casuals. Um, you know, the people that are coming in who – Maybe you don't know a lot of fighters on this card, but know Amanda Nunez. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not telling anybody stuff about her lifestyle that that nobody knows. But she's she's done a Modelo commercial where you know, you know, she she has a girlfriend who fights in the UFC named Nina Ansaroff. Um, you know, she's a straw weight. Um, you know, she's she's out of the closet. Um, you know, she's been on talk shows. So this is I'm not I'm not like putting stuff out there that's not already out there by her. Um, but people know her not only as a fighter, but they know her as a personality. Um, so, And she's got a picture on DK. Yeah, yeah, she's got to have ownership. <laughs> um, and, and even, the, you know, the hardcores who don't miss UFC events since 2015, like me, like we, we all see that, okay, it's a minus 500, but would anybody not play her if she was minus 1,000? Maybe not as a straight play. Yeah. Um, but like I've actually seen higher salaries, you know, for top tier fighters on DraftKings. So I think at her price point, I'm going to say north of 50 with, with the general caveat that I am awful at predicting ownership, like guys like Marley and Brett and, you know, those guys are really good or, or much better than I am at predicting ownership. I didn't phrase that correctly. I apologize. I, I, what about yourself, yourself personally? What, what do you uh, think myself? Really? Um, I will probably, because again, um, I would probably be at market. I'll be okay. at market. Whatever the market is, I'll be at market just because I want to try to win this thing, right? I want this million dollars. I'm going to probably take some shots that I normally wouldn't take in mass entry just to differentiate myself. Yeah, I'm going to have a core group of lineups, but I'm definitely going to be more risky with some of my, my lineups, what I call my hedge lineups, um, to get exposure. Um, I'm going to leave salary on the table. That's the other thing. You've got to leave salary on the table because when people build lineups, it's almost human nature or intrinsic to actually use your salary. And if you see two fighters and um, that are left and you can get the higher priced one, you're going to gravitate towards that higher priced fighter because you think somebody must know something to make that person higher priced. It's the same in all sports, right? I would say go against that <laughs> and take the other fighter at least in a certain percentage of your lineups, or especially if you've done your research and you feel that the, that the lower priced fighter is a better play, don't let the salary, the fact that you're leaving salary on the table, talk you off of making that play because, you know, leaving salary on the table is the way that 200 people are not going to carve up this, this contest or more are not going to racing variants. Right. Uh, but what is the most you're willing to leave? I, you know, it's funny because people ask that all the time. I don't actually look at, sal look at salary left when I'm, when I'm using the optimizer. And I think we talked about this last week. I use an optimizer to generate lineups, not create lineups. Like, so everything is my own. Like I put my own percentages in my own projections. You know, if I'm locking in fighters for a core, that's all me. Um, so if I want to generate a certain number of lineups and the lineup optimizer is giving me um, less than that amount, which is always the case. Um, I'm going to use those lineups irrespective of how much salary is left on the table. I've had lineups where I've left 3,000, 4,000 wow. table simply because I wanted that exposure um, to those lineups. So, and the optimizer told me that I couldn't get any more. It's, it's a number less than the number of lineups that I wanted with those percentage allocations. So I'm just going to use all the salary. I'm, I mean, I'm going to use whatever salary they give me. Give me your favorite fighter on this slate when you consider asking price, when you consider upside, when you consider what you reject as the ownership. 
Uh, what, what, what fighter makes you most excited? Um, again, I'm, I, this is not a very exciting pick, and we talked about it before. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the Menafield train. I do think Menafield, because he's not as flashy as Shane O'Malley, um, because he is not as well known as Nunez, um, I'm not going to say I'm not going to say he's going to be under owned, but I'm going to say, and, and he's not as flashy as Burns, whose brother just came off of a, a win against you know Woodley. So there's name recognition there. It wouldn't surprise me if Burns got higher ownership than Menafield, with the with the caveat that I'm not graded for casting ownership. Um, I like many Menafield. I really do. I like him a lot here. I think um, I'm not saying to necessarily pivot. Often of Nunez, I'm just saying that you should have Menafield represented. Um, it's a well-known fact that he has a hard time getting fights. Um, not a lot of people want to step up and fight him. Um, I think this is a good fight for him. I think stylistically he should do well. I mean, we know what Devin Clark's ceiling is in the UFC. I would be really surprised if Devin Clark gave him a lot of trouble. Um, probably not, you know... I mean, he's not the dominator, maybe, that, that people see Nunez as. And I think for that reason, he's not going to garner the same level of ownership. So I will probably have at least the same amount of lineups with, with Menafield as I will with Nunez. All right. Any other final thoughts you want to give as far as a slate from a DK perspective? Or, or we can just jump over and give a, a take or two in the DK Sportsbook. I'm not sure. Have you dug in? Have you looked at the odds and things like that? Yeah, I mean, they, they just actually dropped um, – you know, inside the distance props and they've, they've dropped some, um, some winning method props. So yeah, I think we can, um, yeah, we can certainly talk about some bets. Um, the only thing I would say, and, and again, I see that there are four or five fights that are fairly closely lined. Um, and you want to spread your exposure here. Um, you know, if you're doing mass entry, mass entry, and you're trying to, you know, win a, a sizable prize, in this contest that there's a lot going to be a lot of entrance in you're going to need to spread and you don't need to play those lineups in, in the, in the 20 max or the three max. I mean, you want lineups that are designated to differentiate yourself in this contest, you know, so take on a little risk. Don't be afraid to leave salary on the table. Um, and look, good luck. I mean, look, it's not the worst thing in the world. If you have to divide this up with a hundred people, it's still a pretty decent day's work. Um, and I, I would honestly be very surprised if one person won it. I think it's just a matter of how many people are going to split it up. Yeah, well, if one of those lineups that had like 2,500 left over, it, it, you might have it all to yourself, or maybe like one or two other people or something like that. And that's what you're doing, obviously, uh, trying to uh, split yourself and separate yourself from the pack. And, you know, uh, like you said, human nature is to spend that salary. And I know in all the sports I play, I mean, from a cash game perspective, different conversation. We're talking about playing for first, especially when first is 40% on top. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, risk versus war reward, and you're encouraged for sure to be ambitious. Uh, Vegas lines. You mentioned Wyland a couple of times. He's plus three thirty three. Uh, is that a live dog for you against O'Malley? Yeah, I mean, I think he's a live dog, but I mean, uh, I mean, I, I like him more on DraftKings, you know, to, because I think he's got a solid floor. Where in DraftKings, having a solid floor, you, you could be a moral victory for a guy that that's who's that cheap. Um, where you can get you can get points where there is no moral victory in, in betting. Um, you know, you're either going to win or you're going to lose. So I don't know. I mean, look, maybe I, I'll throw one of those Hail Mary parlays that I, I kind of like to do out there where I, I throw some dogs that I think are live and, and, you know, look to get a lot of leverage, you know, in one of these parlays. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, I don't know that I would, I would necessarily bet them straight. Um, but – Maybe, like I said, a small parlay that's got a couple of really high leverage fighters in it. Uh, anybody jumping out here? Otherwise, if uh, not looking at Wyland, it doesn't have to be a dog necessarily. Maybe a, a favorite you feel pretty strongly in. No, the lines I, a little I, bit wrong. I, I'm looking at the at the to go the distance okay. here, and one of them that kind of is jumping out to me, and it's not a horrific. It's minus one fifty. It's Cody Garbrandt, Ian Heinish. Um, I'm sorry, Cody Cody Garbrandt and. Uh, uh, Raphael Sunsau. something. Yeah, so Raphael Sunsau. Um, I'm sorry, it's plus 115. So it's plus 115. You're actually getting plus money. Um, Cody has got Cody has got solid boxing. So if Cody is on point, I can certainly see him KOing Rafi Sunsau. Um, a Sunsau has got some good jujitsu. Um, and even though he's not known as a, a, a prolific 
power puncher, Cody Garbrandt has got a pretty weak chin. <clears throat> so at plus money, I would be willing to take a stab uh, at plus 115 that that fight does not go the distance. Um, because I, I see Co- Cody looking for a finish. Cody has been off for a while. He's He, he, he lost his last fight. Um, he needs to do something spectacular. I don't. I think Cody is going out there not only to look to win, but looking to get a bonus, like for a fight of the night. And to do that, he's not going to get that with a decision. So he's going to go out there looking to finish Rafia Sunsau, maybe blitz him and try to finish him, which is good if you're betting inside the distance. Also, it's good because he's going to be sticking his chin out and, and he's going to be willing to take chances to get that finish. So he could leave himself open for something by a really experienced fighter in Rafi Sunsau, a Sunsau. So I, I like that inside the distance. I like that at plus 115. And I also, you know, don't think that the line on Menafield is horrific. I mean, you know, it, it's hard it's hard to make it a hot take that you're you're willing to lay minus 240 on someone, but I don't think that that, that is a horrible line on, on Menafield. I, I think you could maybe look to parlay that. I mean, look, if you parlay that, and you have the book open. If you were to parlay that fight with with Nunez, let's say you parlayed, do you, does that get you? How far away from even money uh, does that get you if you parlay Menafield, Menafield, and and Nunez? Let's see. I have the book open. I'm not sure if I can actually like, play that out because I'm not. I'm in Tennessee, where well, with sports gambling is passed. It's not been you know, verified, and yada yada yada. It's still in the yeah. That's right. Goal. You guys are up next. I'll tell you. Okay, so if you were to parlay Amanda Nunez and Menafield. That gets you to minus 158 or three to two. That's not horrible. Yeah. So, you know, and if you want to actually throw a third fighter in there, like l- let's say you, you know, you like, you like Stamen or you like, um, you know, O'Malley. If you like one of those guys, you could certainly throw one of those guys in. And let's say you throw Cody Stamen in minus 260. That actually gets you to plus 120. So you could take three fighters who've got reasonably good chances or or, or great chances to win, uh, and you're, you're you now got a plus one hundred and twenty wager. I typically don't do that unless I'm super confident that all three guys are going to win. But I do kind of like you know the minus one hundred and fifty eight by parlaying Nunez and Menafield because I am fairly confident and would be very surprised if both of those fighters lost or if, well, I'm sorry if one of those fighters lost um so the minus 158 is not bad but if you're looking for plus money the under the, the, does not go the distance in um in Cody Garbrandt Rafi Asuncel uh unless there's anything else you have you want to say regarding this slate from a DFS perspective from a gambling perspective I know you're just now seeing a lot of it you know, just dropping here on a Wednesday afternoon so uh it's hard to just drop on your before we record especially when it comes to some of these odds here but uh, if you have any, any last words, feel free to do yeah, so. I, I, I have a little sleep. bit of advice here. Okay, so it often goes overlooked, but there is a TV slate that comes out that's offered up by DraftKings. And that TV slate usually includes um, the main card. Sometimes it actually includes like all the fights that are not on, um, that are not streaming, that are on pay-per-view. You know, it varies, but there is a TV slate last week the TV slate included eight of the 11 fights. It's a separate slate for betting purposes. Um, honestly, that bailed me out. And I'll, there are a lot of people that kind of blow through all their bankroll in filling contests for the main slate. So there are some really good contests in the TV slate, like, you know, for 20,000 the first, which is not bad for a day's pay, that are, might have less ownership, less sharps, in those contests because a lot of bankroll has been expended. I mean, look, if you don't have 60 tickets like I do, and you're spending a hundred and you're putting 150 lineups chasing the Millie maker, right? That's a pretty sizable commitment at $25 a lineup. So uh, my one piece of advice is do not overlook that TV slate. There's often some value. And a lot of times it's better fights that are on the TV slate, which might be a little bit more predictable. There might be some less variance. So if you are playing ROI or you even want to take a shot at, you know, 10 to 20 K for first for some of those TV slate contests, um, you know, fire away, like save some of your money, save some of your bankroll for those TV slate contests. 
Much appreciate your time, Joe. Uh, tell the people where they can find you all around the interwebs. And I'm going to lock you in. Like, if, uh, I assume there's a slate next week. Uh, even if you win the Millie, yeah. you're going to come back, right? Well, here's, here's the thing. Here, oh, I'm coming back if I win the Millie. I'll come back if I don't win the Millie. <laughs> reason why you want me back next week is because I told you I did not give myself this name, so I'm not patting myself on the back, but I am told that I am the Chick Whisperer. And there are a lot of women's fights on next week's slate, including the main event, which I have an extremely strong take on. And also one of my favorite wrestlers, and you, you want to talk nicknames, the Raging Panda is fighting next week, Julia Avia. Love her. Solid wrestler. Doesn't have a lot of striking. She's fighting next week. One of the least hard on the eyes female fighters in MMA, period. Lipsky. Lipinski is fighting next week. You've got a lot of women's fights next week. I got a very strong take on the main event. Um, you know, people are going to be kind of like hung over from the Millie Maker. I think there's certainly some value. I've looked at the fights. I like the fights. I think uh, as a wagering card, I really have some strong plays for next week. Where can the people find you around the, uh, the interwebs? I, I'm, I'm at Sun Tzu, S-U-N-T-S-Z-U, on Twitter, um, I'm willing to talk fights. Um, you know, don't hit me up and ask me for my cash lineup. But other than that, you know, I, I'm, I'm always I always participate in a lot of these chats. Um, you know, with, with everything going on right now in the U.S., um, you know, I, it's a great respite to kind of focus on. You know, to kind of lose yourself in the MMA slate for like six hours on Saturday. So I'm very looking forward to that. I hope other people are as well. And like I said, if I don't win this. Um, I really hope it's one of our, our MMA community that wins it, like, like, a, like a Brett Apley, like a Kyle Marley, like, you know, like any of the guys who, along with me, have been, you know, churning away since 2015 in MMA. Um, but I, I encourage people to play it because you never know. There you go. 25 bucks can turn it into a million. That, that's good times for sure. Well, that's a million, assuming you're not splitting it with your 100 of your best friends. And, that's, and we're not talking about taxes here either. <laughs> If you're in Canada, I think you're in the clear. It's well, in Canada, as long as you don't do it for a living, I'm told, there are yeah. no taxes on, on, on gambling earnings. So as long as you don't do it for a living. We want to wish uh, you luck uh, in the Millie Maker and everybody else that's listening as well, too. And if Joe, if Joe helps you out, let him know on Twitter, too. And if he doesn't, uh, don't <laughs> be kind. Look, I, 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 I put myself out on an island, Dean, so feel free. I, I fully <laughs> own up to – to takes that I make and uh, you know, I'll accept the shout out for a right take. I'll, I'll take whatever abuse you want to roll at me. Um, you are betting with your money though. Let's, let's be very clear. That's Sun Tzu Joe. I'm Dean. Uh, thanks for listening to everybody out there. This is the morning grind. We're out of here. Holler.